I'm Evan Ackerman, and welcome to Chatbot, a new podcast from IEEE Spectrum, where robotics experts interview each other about things that they find fascinating. On this episode of Chatbot, we'll be talking with Davide Skaramutsa and Adam Bry about agile autonomous drones. Adam Bry is the CEO of Skydio, a company that makes consumer camera drones with an astonishing amount of skill at autonomous tracking and obstacle avoidance. The foundation for Skydio's drones can be traced back to Adam's work on autonomous agile drones at MIT. And after spending a few years at Google working on Project Wings delivery drones, Adam co-founded Skydio in 2014. Skydio is currently on their third generation of consumer drones, and earlier this year, the company brought on three PhD students from Davide's lab to expand their autonomy team. Davide Skaramutsa directs the Robotics and Perception Group at the University of Zurich. His lab is best known for developing extremely agile drones that can autonomously navigate through complex environments at very high speeds, faster, it turns out, than even the best human drone racing champions. Davide's drones rely primarily on computer vision, and he's also been exploring potential drone applications for a special kind of camera called an event camera, which is ideal for fast motion under challenging lighting conditions. So Davide, you've been doing drone research for a long time now, like a decade at least, if not more. Uh, since 2009, 13 <laughs> years. <laughs> so what, what still fascinates you about, about drones after so long? So what fascinates me about drones is their freedom. So that's what, that was the reason why I decided uh, back then in 2009 to actually move from uh, ground robots. I was working until that time on uh, self-driving cars to drones. And uh, actually the trigger was uh, when Google announced the self-driving car project. And then uh, for me and many researchers, it was clear that actually many things were now transitioning from academia to to, to industry. And so we had to come up with new ideas and things. And then with my PhD advisor at the time, Roland Sigvart, we realized actually that drones, especially quadcopters were, you know, just uh, coming out, but they were all uh, remote controlled or you, uh, they were actually using GPS. And so then uh, we said, uh, what about uh, flying drones autonomously, but with the uh, onboard cameras? And this was, w- this had never been done until then. But what fascinates me about drone, drones is the fact that actually they can overcome obstacles on the ground very quickly. And especially this can be very useful for, for many applications that matter to us all today, like, uh, first of all, search and rescue, but also other things like inspection of difficult infrastructures like bridges, uh, power masts, uh, oil platforms and so on. And, and Adam, your drones are, are doing some of these things, many of these things. And um, of course, I, I'm... I am fascinated by drones and by what your drone is able to do, but I'm curious when you introduce it to people who have maybe never seen it, how do you describe like, I, I guess the, the, almost the magic of, of what it can do. Uh, so the way that we think about it is, is pretty simple. Our basic goal is to build in the skills of an expert pilot into the drone itself, um, which involves a little bit of hardware. It means we need sensors that see everything in every direction. And we need a powerful computer on board, but is is mostly a software problem, um, and it becomes quite application specific. So for consumers, for example, our drones can follow and film moving subjects and avoid obstacles and create this incredibly compelling dynamic footage. Uh, and the goal there is really, you know, what would happen if you had the world's best drone pilot flying that thing, trying to film something in an interesting, compelling way? We want to make that uh, available to to anybody using one of our products even if they're not an expert pilot and even if they're not at the controls when it's it's flying itself so you can just you know put it in your hand tell it to take off it'll turn around and start tracking you and then you can do whatever else you want to do and and the drone takes care of the rest um in the industrial world it's entirely different so for a uh, inspection application say for a bridge you just tell the drone here's the structure or scene that i care about and then we have a product called 3d scan that will automatically explore it build a real-time 3d map and then use that map to take high resolution photos of the entire structure. And to, to follow on a bit to what Davide was saying, I, mean, I think if you sort of abstract away a bit and think about what capability do drones offer, um, you know, thinking about camera drones, it's basically you can put an image sensor or really any kind of sensor anywhere you want, anytime you want. And then the extra thing that we're bringing in is 
without needing to have a person uh, there to control it. And I think the combination of all those things together is uh, is transformative. And we're seeing the impact of that in a lot of these applications today. But I think that that really realizing the full potential is a is a you know ten twenty year kind of project. Mm -hmm. It's interesting when you when you talk about um, the way that we can think about the Skydio drone is like having an expert drone pilot to uh, to fly this thing uh, because there's so much skill involved. And David, I know that you've been working on uh, like very high performance drones that can maybe challenge even some of these these expert pilots in performance. And I'm curious when like expert drone pilots come in and see what your drones can do autonomously, like for the first time, like, are, is it scary for them? Are they just excited? Like, how do they, how do they react? First of all, they, they actually, they, they say, wow. So they, they cannot believe what they see. Uh, but then they get super excited, but at the same time nervous. So uh, we started working on autonomous drone racing uh, five years ago, but uh, in the first uh, three years, we have, we have been flying very slowly uh, and uh, like three meters per second. So they were really snails. But then in the last two years is when actually we started really uh, pushing the limits, uh, both in control, planning and perception. So this is our re most recent drone, by the way. And now we can really fly at the same level of agility as humans, not yet at the level to beat human, but we are very, very close. So we started the collaboration with uh, Marvin, uh, who is uh, the, the, drum, uh, the Swiss champion. And uh, he's only, now he's 16 years old. So let's see, he was 15 years old. So he's a boy. And uh, he actually was, uh, was uh, very mad at the drone. So he was super, super nervous when, when he saw this. So he, he, he didn't even smile the first time. Uh, he was always saying, I can do better, I can do better. So actually his reaction was, uh, was quite scary. He was scared actually by, by what the drone was capable of doing, but he knew that basically we were using uh, the motion capture. Now, uh, and he knew though that, uh, you know, if you try to play in a fair comparison, in a fair setting with where both the autonomous drone uh, and the, the human piloted drone are using both onboard perceptions or egocentric vision, then uh, things might end up differently. Because in fact, actually our vision based drone, so flying with onboard vision was sl quite slow. But actually now after uh, one year of pushing, we are at a level actually that uh, we can fly a vision-based drone at the level of Marvin, and uh, we are even a bit better than uh, the Marvin at the current moment, using only onboard vision. So we can fly in this arena, the space allows us to go up to 72 kilometers per hour. We reach the 72 kilometers per hour, and we even beat uh, Marvin in, uh, in three consecutive laps so far. Wow. So that's, uh, that's the current state. But we want to now also um, compete against other pilots, other world champions, and see what, what's going to happen. Okay. That's super can, impressive. Can, and, I, can I jump in and ask you a question? Yeah, yeah. I'm interested if you, I mean, since you've spent a lot of time with the expert pilots, if you, if you learn things from the way that they think and fly, or if you just view them as a benchmark to try to beat and the, the algorithms are, are not so much inspired by what they, what they do. So we did, uh, we did all these things. So we did it also in a scientific manner. So first, of course, we interviewed them. We asked any sort of question, what type of features are you actually focus, focusing your attention and so on? How much is, uh, you know, the, the, the people around you, the supporters actually influencing you and the hearing the other opponents actually screaming while they control the pilot influencing you. So there is all these uh, psychological effects that, of course, influencing pilots uh, during a competition. But then what we try to do scientifically is to really understand, uh, first of all, what is the latency uh, of a human pilot? So there have been uh, many studies that have been done for car racing, Formula One, uh, back in the 80s and 90s, where basically they put uh, uh, eye, uh, eye trackers and try to understand, they try to understand basically what is the latency between uh, uh, the, what you see until basically you, you act on your uh, steering wheel. And so we try to do the same for uh, human pilots. So we, uh, we basically installed uh, an eye tracking device on, uh, on our subjects. So we called uh, 20 subjects 
uh, from, uh, from uh, all across uh, Switzerland and some people also from outside Switzerland with different levels of expertise, but they were quite good. Okay, we are not talking about medium experts, but actually already very good experts. And then we will let them rehearse on the track. And then uh, basically we were, we were capturing uh, their uh, eye gazes. And then uh, we basically measured uh, uh, the time latency between uh, um, changes in eye gaze and uh, changes in um, uh, throttle commands on the joystick. And we measured uh, that this latency was 220 milliseconds. Wow. That's that includes high. Yeah. The, the brain latency and the behavioral latency. So the time, you know, to send the, con uh, the control commands once you process the information, the visual information to the to the fingers. So I, I think it, it, it might just be worth like for the audience anchoring that, like what's the typical control latency for a, a digital control loop? It's, I it's mean, typically, I can see it the, it's typically uh, in the order of, uh, well, uh, from uh, images uh, to control commands, uh, usually 20 milliseconds although yeah. we cannot wow. fly with the much uh, higher latencies it really depends yeah. on, the, on the on the speed you want to achieve but typically 20 milliseconds so if you compare 20 milliseconds versus the 220 milliseconds of the human you can already see that eventually the machine should beat the human then uh, another thing that you asked me was uh, what the what did we learn from uh, from human pilots so what we learned it was uh, uh, Interestingly, we learned that basically they were always pushing the throttle of the joystick at the maximum thrust. And, uh, but uh, can, actually, can, this that, is, that's, uh, yeah. that's very consistent with optimal control theory. Like, uh -huh. <laughs> exactly. But yeah. uh, what when we then realized is that, and they told us, was that uh, it was interesting for them to observe that actually for the AI was better to break earlier rather than later as the human was, was actually doing. And we published these results in, uh, in Science Robotics uh, last summer. And, uh, and we did this uh, actually using uh, an algorithm that computes uh, the time optimal trajectory from the start to the finish through all the gates. So and by exploiting the full quadrover dynamical model. So it's really, you know, using no, no approximation, no point mass model, no polynomial trajectory, it's the full quadrilateral model. It takes a lot to compute, let me tell you, it takes uh, like uh, one hour or more, depending on the length of the trajectory, but it does a very good job. To a point that Gabriel Kocher, so who works for the Drone Racing League, told us, ah, this is very interesting. That, so I, I didn't know, actually, I can push even faster if I start breaking, you know, before this gate. Yeah, it seems like it went the other way around, like you... Mm -hmm. the optimal control strategy taught the human something. Davide, do you have some questions for, for Adam? Yes. So <laughs> since you mentioned that basically um, one of the, the scenarios or one of the, the, the applications that uh, you are targeting is basically cinematography, where basically you want to uh, take uh, amazing shots at the level of uh, Hollywood, maybe producers using uh, your autonomous drones. And this is actually very interesting. Um, so what I want to ask you is, um, in general, so going beyond cinematography, if you look at the performance uh, of autonomous drones in general, it, it still looks to me that for generic applications, they are still uh, uh, behind uh, human pilot performance. I'm thinking of, uh, you know, beyond cinematography and beyond drone racing, I'm thinking of uh, search and rescue operations and many things. So my question to Adam is, uh, do you think that providing a higher level of agility to your platform could potentially unlock new use cases or even extend existing use cases of the Skydio drones? You're asking specifically about agility, flight agility, like yes. responsiveness and maneuverability? Yes. Exactly. Um, I think that it is, I mean, in general, I think that most things with drones have this kind of product property where like the the more like the more you get better at something the the better it's going to be for most users and the more applications will be unlocked and this is true for a lot of things it's true for some things that we even wish it wasn't true for like flight time you know like the longer the flight time 
the the more interesting cool things people are going to be able to do with it and there's kind of no upper limit there like the the longer you know different use cases it might taper off but you're going to unlock more and more use cases the longer you can fly um i think that agility is is one of these parameters where like the more the better although i will say it's not the thing that i feel like we're hitting a ceiling on now in terms of being able to provide value to our users like there are there are cases within different applications. So for example, search and rescue, being able to fly through like a really tight gap or something um, where it would it would be useful. And for, you know, capturing cinematic video, similar story, like being able to fly at high speed through some really challenging um, course uh, where I think it it would uh, would make a difference. So I think that there are there are areas out there in user groups that we're currently serving where it would where it would matter, but I don't think it's like the it's not the thing that I feel like we're we're hitting right now in terms of sort of like the lowest hanging fruit to to unlock more value for users. Um, yeah. So you believe though that in the long term, actually achieving human level agility would actually be a, a added value for your drones. I, I definitely, yeah. I think that, I mean one sort of mental model that I think about for the long term direction of the products is is looking at what birds can do and the agility that birds have and the kinds of maneuvers that that makes them capable of and, you know, being able to land in tricky places or being able to slip through small gaps or being able to like change direction quickly, like that affords them capability that I think is, is definitely useful to, to have in, in drones and, and, uh, and would unlock some value. Um, but I, I think the other, the other really interesting thing is that the, the autonomy problem spans multiple sort of ranges of, of hierarchy. And at, when you get towards the top, there's human judgment that I think is, is very, I mean, it's crucial to a lot of things that people want to do with drones and it's very difficult to automate. And I think it's actually relatively low value to automate. So, you know, for example, in a search and rescue mission, a person might have a search and rescue worker might have very particular context on uh, you know, where somebody is likely to be, to be stuck or maybe be hiding or something that would be very difficult to encode into a drone. You know, they might have some context from a clue that came up earlier in the case or something about the environment or something about the weather. Uh, and so one of the things that, that we think a lot about in how we build our products, you know, we're a company, we're trying to make useful stuff for people. So we have a pretty pragmatic approach on these fronts is, is basically you know, we're not religiously committed to automating everything. We're basically trying to, to automate the things where we can give the best tool to somebody to then apply the judgment that they have as a, as a person and an operator to get done what they want to get done. And uh, actually, yeah, now that you mentioned this, I have another question. So I've watched uh, many of your previous tech talks uh, and also interacted with, uh, with you guys uh, at conferences. So what I learned, and correct me, correct me if I'm wrong, is that you're using a, a lot of deep learning on the perception side. So for yeah. uh, as part of the 3D reconstruction, uh, semantic understanding. But it seems to me that uh, on the control and planning side, you're still relying basically on optimal control. And uh, I wanted to ask you, so uh, if this is the case, well, are you happy then with optimal control? We also know that Boston Dynamics is actually uh, using yeah. only optimal control. Actually, they even claim yeah. they are not using any deep learning in, uh, in control and planning. So is yeah. this actually also what you experience? And um, if this is the case, uh, do you believe that in the future, actually, you will be using deep learning also in planning and control? And where exactly do you see the benefits of deep learning there? Yeah, that, that's a that's a super interesting question. So. What you described at a high level is is essentially right. So our perception stack, um, I mean, we do a lot of different things in perception, but we're we're pretty heavily using deep learning throughout for semantic understanding, for spatial understanding, um, and then our planning and control stack is based on more conventional kind of optimal control um, optimization and 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 full state feedback control techniques, um, and you know it generally works pretty well. Having said that, we did uh, we put out a blog post on this. Uh, we did a, a research project where we basically did end-to-end, -end, uh, pretty close to like an end-to-end -end learning system where we replaced a good chunk of the planning stack with something that was based on machine learning. Um, and we got it to the point where it was good enough for, for flight demonstrations. Uh, and 
for the amount of work that we put into it relative to like the capability that we got, I think the results were, were really compelling. And, you know, my general outlook on this stuff, I think that the planning and controls is an area where the, the models, I think, provide a lot of value, like having a structured model based on physics and first principles does provide a lot of value. And, and it's, it's admissible to that kind of modeling. You know, you can write down the mass and the inertia and the rotor parameters and the physics of quadcopters are such that those things are like, tend to be pretty accurate and, and tend to work pretty well. And by, by starting with that structure, you, you can come up with like quite a capable system. Having said that, I think that the, you know, to me, the trajectory of, of machine learning and deep learning is such that eventually I think it will dominate almost everything because being able to learn based on data and having these representations that are incredibly flexible and can encode sort of subtle relationships that that might exist, but but wouldn't fall out of a more conventional physics model, I think is is really powerful. And then I also think being able to do more end to end stuff where subtle um, sort of second or third order perception impact or s second or third order perception uh, or or real world physical world things can then trickle through into planning and control actions, I think is also uh, quite powerful. So, you know, I generally that's the direction I see us going um, and we've done some research on this um, and you know you'll I think the way it, you'll see it going is like we'll use sort of the same optimal control structure we're using now but we'll inject more learning into it and then eventually the thing might evolve to the point where it looks more like a, a like a, a deep neural work end to end. Now earlier you mentioned that uh, you foresee that in the future drones will be flying uh, more uh, agilely, similar to human pilots, and even in tight spaces. You even mentioned like, you know, passing through a narrow gap or even, you know, in a small corridor. So, you know, when you navigate in, in tight spaces, of course, ground effect is very, is very strong. So mm -hmm. do you guys then uh, uh, model these aerodynamic effects, ground effect, not just ground effect? Do you try to model all possible yeah. aerodynamic effects, especially when you fly close to structures? We... It's an interesting question. So today we don't model, um, we, we estimate the wind, we estimate like the local wind velocity. Um, and we've actually found that we can do that pretty accurately, uh, around the drone. And then that the local wind that we're estimating gets fed back into the control system to compensate. And so that, that's kind of like a catch all bucket for, you know, you could think about ground effect as like a variation. This is not exactly how it works, obviously, but you could think about it as like a variation and in the local wind and, and our response times on those, like the ability to estimate wind and then feed it back into control is, is pretty quick. Um, although it's not instantaneous. So if we had like a feed forward model where we knew as we got close to structures, this is how the wind is likely to vary. We could probably do slightly better. Um, and I think you're, you know, what you're, you're pointing at here, I basically agree with, I think the, the more that you kind of try to squeeze every drop of like performance out of these things, you're flying with maximum agility in very dense environments, the more these things start to matter. Um, and I could see us wanting to do something like that uh, in the future. And I, those, you know, I, that stuff's fun. I think it's fun when you sort of hit the limit and then you have to invent better new algorithms and, and, uh, and, and bring more information to bear to get the performance that you want. Um, on this, perhaps related, what well, you, you can tell me. I, so you, you guys have done uh, a lot of work with event cameras. Um, and I think that you were, um, this might not be right, but to, from what I Scene. I think you were one of the first, if not the first, to put these put event cameras on on quadcopters. I'd be very interested in, and in you've probably told these stories a lot, but I, I still think it'd be interesting to hear. Like, what what steered you towards event cameras? Like, how did you find out about them, and and uh, what made you decide to uh, in, invest in research I, in them? First of all, let me explain what, is, what an event camera is. An event camera is a camera that has uh, also pixels, but uh, differently from a standard camera. An event camera only uh, sends information when there is motion. So if there is no motion, then they, the camera doesn't stream any information. Now, he, he, the camera does this uh, um, through smart pixels, differently from a standard camera where uh, every uh, pixel triggers, infor triggers information at the same time at uh, equidistant time intervals. In an event camera, the, the pixels are smart and they only trigger information whenever a pixel detects motion. Usually a motion is recorded as a change of intensity. And the stream of events happens uh, asynchronously. And the, 
therefore, the, the, the byproduct of this is that uh, you don't get uh, frames, but you only get uh, a stream of information continuously in time with microsecond temporal resolution. So one of the key advantages of event cameras is that basically you, uh, you can actually um, record phenomena that actually would take, you know, expensive uh, high-speed cameras to, to perceive. So, but the, the key difference with the standard camera is that uh, an event camera works in differential mode. And because it works in differential mode, by basically capturing uh, per pixel intensity differences, it, it, consu it consumes very little power, and it also has uh, um, no motion blur, because it doesn't accumulate photons over time. So I would say that for robotics, uh, what I, because you asked me, how did I found out? So what I really, really saw, actually, that was very useful for, for robotics about event cameras were two particular things. First of all, the very high temporal resolution, because this can be very useful for, uh, for safety, critical systems, and I'm thinking about drones, but also to avoid collisions with the, um, in, you know, in the automotive setting, because now we are also working in automotive settings as well. And also when you have to navigate uh, in low lit environments where uh, using a standard camera uh, with the high exposure times, you, you would actually be um, coping with the, a lot of motion blur that would actually cause a uh, feature loss and, uh, and, uh, and other artifacts like, you know, uh, impossibility to detect uh, objects and so on. So event cameras excel at this, no motion blur and very low latency. Another thing that could be also very interesting for especially lightweight robotics, and I'm thinking of micro drones, would be actually the fact that they consume also very little power. So little power, in fact, just to be on an event camera consumes one milliwatt on average, because in fact, the power consumption depends on the dynamics of the scene. If nothing moves, that, then the power consumption is very negligible. If something moves, it's in the order of m m between one milliwatt or maximum 10 milliwatt. Now, the interesting thing is that if you then uh, couple event cameras with the spiking uh, neuromorphic chips that also consume le less than one milliwatt, you can actually mount them on a micro drones and you can do amazing things. And we, we started working on it. Uh, the problem is that how do you train these spiking networks, but that's another story. Other uh, interesting things uh, where I, I see uh, potential applications of event cameras are um, also, for example, now think about your keyframe features of the Skydio drones. And uh, here what you're doing, guys, is that basically you are flying the drone around and then you're trying to say 3D positions and orientation of where you would like then a posterior to fly uh, faster through. But the images are being captured uh, while the drone is still. So basically you move the drone to a certain position, you orient it in the direction where later you want it to fly, and then you record the position and orientation. And later the drone will fly agilely through it. But that means that basically the drone should be able to relocalize fast with respect to this keyframe. Well, at some point, this, there are failure modes. We, we already know it, there are failure modes. When the illumination goes down and uh, you know, there is motion blur, uh, and this is actually something where I see actually the in-event camera could, uh, could be beneficial. And, uh, and then do, other things- Do you agree with that, Adam? Yeah. Say again. Mm -hmm. do, do you agree, Adam? <laughs> uh, I guess I'm, I mean, this is kind of why I'm ask, asking the question. I'm very curious about event cameras. I, I see them when I have kind of the pragmatic hat on of like trying to build these systems and make them as useful as, as possible. I see event cameras as, as quite complementary to traditional cameras. Um, so it's hard for me to see a, a future where, you know, for example, on our products, we would be only using event cameras. But I can certainly imagine a future where if they were compelling from a size, weight, cost standpoint, we would have them as an additional sensing mode to get a lot of the benefits that, that Davide is, is talking about. And I don't know if that's a research direction that um, you guys are thinking about. And, you know, in a research context, I think it's, it's very cool and interesting to see what can you do with just an event camera. Um, I think that the, the most likely scenario to me is that they would become like a, a complementary sensor. And there, there's probably a lot of interesting things to be done of using standard cameras and event cameras side by side and getting the, the benefits of both. Because I think that the, the context that you get from a conventional camera that's just giving you like 
full static images of the scene um, mm -hmm. combined with an event camera could be quite interesting. Like you can imagine using the event camera to like to sharpen and get better fidelity mm -hmm. out of the the conventional camera. And you could use the event camera for like faster response times and but but it gives you less of a global picture than the conventional camera. So Davide smiling, maybe I'm I'm yeah, sure he's thought about all these ideas as so well. We have been working on, on exactly on combining event cameras with standard cameras now for the past three years. So, so initially, when we started uh, almost 10 years ago, of course, we only focused on event cameras alone because it was intellectually very yeah. challenging. But the reality is that an event camera, let's not forget, it's a, a, it's a differential sensor. So uh, it's only complementary to the standard camera. It, you will never get the full absolute intensity from out of an event camera. We showed that you can actually uh, reproduce the the grayscale intensity up to an unknown absolute intensity uh, with very high fidelity, by the way, but uh, it's only um, complementary to a standard camera, as you correctly said. So actually, uh, you already mentioned everything we, we, we are working on and we were also already published. So for example, you, you mentioned the uh, unblurring, blurry frames. This also has already been done, not by my group, but the, by the group of uh, Richard Hartley at uh, uh, University of Canberra in Australia. And uh, what we also showed uh, in my group last year is that um, we could also, you can also generate uh, um, super slow motion video by combining an event camera with a standard camera by basically using the events in the blind time between two frames to interpolate and generate arbitrary frames at any arbitrary time. And uh, so we, we showed that we could actually upsample a low frame rate video by a factor of 50. Wow. Yeah. And uh, this uh, with uh, only consuming 1 40th of the memory footprint. And this is interesting do you, because... Do you think from, this is, this is a curiosity question, from a hardware standpoint, I'm wondering if it'll go the next, go even a bit further, like if we'll just start to see image sensors that do both together. I mean, you could certainly imagine like just putting the two pieces of silicon right next to each other, or I don't know enough about image sensor design, but even at the pixel level, you could have pixel like just superimposed on the same same piece of silicon, you could have event pixels yeah. next to standard accumulation pixels, and get mm -hmm. both sets of data out of one sensor. Exactly. So both things have been uh, done. So they the very yeah. latest one I described, we actually installed an event camera side by side with uh, a very high resolution standard camera. But there is uh, already an event camera called Davis that outputs both frames and uh, events between the frames. This has been available already since 2016, but at a very wow. low resolution. And only, only last year it reached the VGA resolution. That's why, right. you know, we are it's combining like, yeah. an event camera with the high resolution standard yeah. camera because we want to basically see what we could possibly do one day when these event, when these event cameras are also available yeah. in high resolution together with, with the standard camera uh, overlaid on the same pixel array. But there is a good news because you also asked me another question about cost of this camera. So, so the price, as you know very well, uh, drops as soon as, you know, there is a mass product for it. The good news is that uh, Samsung has now a product called the Smart vision uh, smart things vision um, sensor that basically is um, uh, conceived for uh, uh, indoor home monitoring so to basically detect people falling at home and this device automatically triggers an emergency call so this device is using an event camera and it costs 180 euros which is much less than the cost of an event camera when you buy it from these companies, that it's around 3,000 euros. So that's a very good news. Now, if there will be like, you know, other bigger, you know, applications, we can expect that the price will go down a lot below even $5. That's what these companies are openly saying. I mean, I, what I expect, honestly, uh, is that it will follow what, what we experienced with the, with the, um, the time of flight cameras. I mean, the first time of flight cameras were will cost around $15,000 and then 15 years later, they were below $150. You know, I'm thinking of the first uh, Kinect uh, 2 that was time of flight and so on. And now we have them all since a smartphone. So it all depends on the market. Maybe uh, like one more question from, from each of you guys, if you've got one you've been saving for the end. <laughs> okay, the very last question, it would be very... 
So I, I, I okay. I, I, I ask Adam, and then you tell me if you want to answer or not, rather not. It's of course about defense. So the question I prepared, I told Ivan. Uh, um, so I read in the news uh, that Scadio donated uh, uh, 300k uh, of uh, equivalent of drones to to Ukraine. So my question is, what are your views on military you? Military, military use, dual use of quadcopters, and what is the philosophy of Skydio regarding defense applications of drones? I don't know if you want to answer. Yeah, that, that's a great question. I'm, I'm happy to answer that. Um, so our, our mission, which we've, we've talked about quite publicly, is to make the world more productive, creative, and safe with autonomous flight. Um, and the, the position that we've taken is, and which I feel very strongly about, is that working with uh, the militaries of free democracies is is very much in alignment and and in support of that mission. So, um, going back three or four years, we've been working with the U.S. Army. We uh, won the Army's short range reconnaissance program, which was essentially a competition to select the official kind of soldier carried quadcopter uh, for the U.S. Army. And the broader trend there, which I think is really interesting and in line what we've seen in other technology categories, is Basically, the consumer and civilian technology just raced ahead of the traditional defense systems. You know, the military has been using drones for decades, uh, but their soldier carried systems were these like multi hundred thousand dollar things that are quite clunky, quite difficult to use, not super capable. And, you know, our products and other products in the consumer world basically got to the point where they had comparable and in many cases superior capability at a, at a fraction of the cost. And I think to the credit of of the US military and, and other uh, departments of defense and, and ministries of defense around the world, I think people realized that and decided that they they were better off going with these kind of dual use systems that were predominantly designed and scaled in civilian markets, but also had defense applicability. And, and that's what we've done as a company. So it's essentially our consumer civilian product that's extended and tweaked in a couple of ways, like the radio, some of the security protocols uh, to, to serve defense customers. Um, and I'm super proud of the work that we're doing in Ukraine. So we've donated uh, uh, $300,000 worth of systems. At this point, we've um, we've sold way, way more than that. Um, and we have hundreds of systems in Ukraine um, that are being used by Ukrainian defense forces. Uh, and I, you know, I think that's that's good, important work. Um, the, the final piece of this that I'll say is we've also uh, decided and, you know, we aren't doing and we won't put weapons on our drones. Um, so, you know, we're not going to build actual munition systems, um, which I think is, uh, you know, I don't think there's anything ethically wrong with that. Like ultimately militaries need weapon systems and those have an important role to play, but it's just not something that, that, that we want to do as a company and is kind of out of step with the dual use philosophy, which is, is really how we approach these things. Okay. Um, I have a, a, a question that I'm, it's, it's aligned with some of what we've talked about, but I'm very interested how you think about and, and focus the research in your lab now that this stuff is becoming more and more commercialized. You know, there's companies like us and others that are building real products based on a lot of the algorithms that have come out of academia. Um, and in general, I think it's like, it's an incredibly exciting time where the pace of progress is accelerating. There's more and more interesting algorithms out there. Um, and it seems like there's, there's benefits flowing both ways between research labs and between these companies. But I, I'm very interested in how, you, how you're thinking about that these days. Yes, it's a very interesting question. So first of all, I think of you also as a robotics company. And uh, so what you are demonstrating is what, you know, the, uh, the state of the art in robotics and navigation and perception can do. And that the fact that you can do it on a drone, it means you can also do it on other robots. Uh, and that actually is a big, it's a, it's a call for us researchers because it pushes us to think of new venues where we can actually contribute. Otherwise, it's, it looks like everything has been done. And so what, for example, uh, we have been working on in my lab is uh, trying to, so in, in, towards the goal of uh, achieving a human level performance, how do humans do navigate? They don't do optimal control and uh, geometric uh, 3D reconstruction. They, we have a brain that does everything end to end or at least with the net or net subnetworks. So one thing that we have been uh, playing with has been now deep learning for, uh, for already now, uh, yeah, six years. But uh, in the last two years, we, we realized actually that uh, 
you can do a lot with deep networks and uh, also they have uh, some advantages compared to the usual traditional uh, autonomy architectures uh, architecture of autonomous robots so what is the, the standard way to control robots uh, be it flying or or, or ground you have uh, state estimation they have a perception so basically special ai semantic understanding then you have uh, localization path planning and control now all these modules are basically communicating with one another of course uh, you want to them to be communicated in a smart way because uh, you know you want to also try to plan trajectories that facilitate the perception so you avoid motion blur while while you navigate and so on but somehow they are always conceived by humans and so what we are trying to understand is whether you can actually replace uh, some of these blocks or even the old blocks and up to which point with deep networks, which begs the question, can you even train a, 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 a policy end to end that takes as input uh, some sort of sensory um, like either uh, images or even sensory abstractions and outputs control commands of some sort of output abstraction like an high level or like waypoints. And what we found out is that, yes, this can be done. Of course, the problem is that for training these policies, you need a lot of uh, data. And how do you generate this data? You cannot, you know, fly drones in the real world. So we started working more and more in simulation. So now we're actually training all these things in simulation, even for forests. And th this is thanks to the um, video game engines like Unity. Now you can, uh, you know, download a lot of these 3D, mo the 3D environments and then deploy your algorithms there that train and teach a drone to fly in just a bunch of hours rather than flying and crashing drones in the real world, which is very costly as well but the problem is that we need better simulators we need better simulators and i'm not just thinking of photorealism i think that one is actually somewhat solved so i think we need the better physics like aerodynamic effects and, and other and other non-idealities these are difficult to model so we are also working on on these kind of things and then of course another big thing it would be you know you would like to have a navigation policy that is able to abstract and generalize to different type of different type of tasks and possibly at some point even, you know, tell your drone or robot, uh, you know, a high level description of the task and the drone, the robot will actually accomplish the task. That would be the, the dream. I think as a community, robotics community, we are moving towards that. Yeah, I agree. I, uh, I agree and I'm excited about it. We've been talking with Adam Bry from Skydio and Davide Scaramuza from the University of Zurich about agile autonomous drones, and thanks again to our guests for joining us. For Chatbot and IEEE Spectrum, I'm Evan Acker.